Uh, next in the program, uh, we will be listening to Dr. Jeff Hastings, uh, my colleague at the Dallas VA. He is also the Associate Chief of Staff at the VA. He is our uh, physicist, physician, and computer whiz extraordinaire. Uh, he also heads our uh, heart failure clinic at the Dallas VA. Today, Jeff is going to talk to us about current concepts in the management of hypertension, and I am thrilled to introduce him to you. Thank you very much. So I'm uh, actually a little bit excited that there got to be a delay in the conference from December to today because it meant I had to make some changes to my slides because there's been some recent recent updates to hypertension. So a little bit of a redo of my talk. Let's see if we can get... So to start off my disclo disclosure slide, I was the one of the local PIs for Simplicity 3 at the VA, which enrollment is now closed. So to start on hypertension, 76 million Americans, a lot of Americans with hypertension, so 34% of all adults in the United States, half of those with hypertension are over the age of 60. So half of those are over the age of 60. That'll be important later on. About the same for men and women. Many of them have coronary disease, and you know we do a pretty poor job of actually getting hypertension treated and down to where it should be. This data from NHANES here shown in the bar graph shows that 80% of patients with hypertension actually are aware they have hypertension, so many don't know, and that only 71% of patients are treated with, for hypertension with some kind of medication, and of those, only about half actually are controlled on their treatment for hypertension. So is hypertension a problem? It is. This is a meta-analysis of about a million patients from 61 different studies. Here in the blue on your left is systolic blood pressure by decade, uh, y-axis being ischemic heart disease mortality, and on the right side in the green is diastolic blood pressure. And just what I want to point out is that as blood pressure for in each decade of patients, as blood pressure increases, the mortality risk increases. And to the point that the risk of cardiovascular death doubles for every 20 or over 10 millimeter increase in blood pressure over 115 over 75. So hypertension is an issue. I, I also want to point out on these data points, if I can get the mouse, that you know, there might be a little bit on the low end that it starts to make an upward shift, kind of a J-curve, which will be important in just a moment. So what about treating blood pressure? Well, this comes from data in the late 1980s from five large population studies, uh, but showing that it appears some reduction in blood pressure in, in the general population can cause a drastic reduction in mortality, both from stroke, from coronary heart disease, and total mortality, depending upon the reduction in blood pressure. You can see the two millimeter mercury reduction is a 3% reduction in total mortality and a 5% a five millimeter mercury reduction of blood pressure may be a 7% reduction in total mortality. But can we reduce it too much? It comes back to that J point that I was talking about. So it's 22,000 patients from the INVEST trial. And diastolic on your left, systolic on the right, each different line is a different, uh, it, it's a decade of age. But what I really want to point out is on the systolic, that in those who are over 70 and those who are over 80, if their systolic blood pressure gets too low, it appears to increase their mortality. It's actually mortality, heart failure, and stroke. I'm sorry, mortality of my stroke for endpoints in this. Uh, something similar for diastolic blood pressure when it gets quite low. I think we've all talked about that for a while, but, but systolic may be an issue in older patients. So what do we know about treating blood pressure? Well, let's we'll start with JNC7. It's been out there for quite a while, 2003. So about 10 years since the last JNC update. Uh, you know, what we had was normal blood pressure was less than 120 over 80. It was pre-hypertension, which recommended lifestyle modifications. We'll talk about a few of those briefly. Stage one hypertension was up 140 to 160, systolic 90 to 100 diastolic. And primary choice of treatment was a thiazide diuretic. And after that, if there were specific indications, consider an ACE inhibitor, an ARB, a beta blocker, calcium channel blocker. And stage two hypertension over 160 over 100 
uh, recommended starting with dual therapy for treatment of thiazide plus one of the others. As many of you may know, a report came out about two weeks ago, maybe a little more in December, that was considered the JNC8 recommendations. I want to talk about this for just a second because the publication is actually titled A Report from the JNC8 Panelists. It is not titled the JNC8 Guidelines. The reason is that the NHLBI, who was driving these guidelines, pulled out of the guideline business in the middle of 2013, and the panelists decided that they wanted to continue the work they had done and publish what they were going to consider the guidelines. It was not endorsed by the American Heart Association, not endorsed by ACC, different than every other JNC that had come before it. So you have to take that for what it's worth. But their recommendations are that in patients over the age of 60, if their blood pressure is 150 over 90 or higher, they should be treated to lower their blood pressure to get below 190 over, 150 over 90. If you're less than 60 years old, then the goal is similar to what it was before, 140 over 90. If you have chronic kidney disease or diabetes, the goal is now 140 over 90, per their recommendations. In non-blacks, treatment choice is thiazide type diuretic, ACE inhibitor, ARB, calcium channel blocker with no, no primary uh, recommendation. And in blacks, a thiazide type diuretic or a calcium channel blocker recommendations. So let's talk, uh, the JNC8, that panel doesn't talk much about lifestyle modifications. It's, there's a lot of it in JNC7, but I think it's important for us to go through. This is something we deal with all the time in heart failure patients, heart failure readmissions, just plain hypertension, you know, is that uh, sodium is an issue. In the United States, from the um, U.S. Department of Agriculture, average sodium intake is about 3.5 uh, grams a day of sodium. It's a much smaller number than I thought it was, but it's the data that they present worldwide. It's a fairly large range, and most of it comes from processed foods. CDC goals recommend less than 2,300 milligrams, 2.3 grams a day for Americans, unless you have hypertension, you're African American, diabetes, CKD over 51, then their goal is 1,500 milligrams a day. American Heart Association just recommends 1,500 milligrams a day regardless. And does decreasing sodium actually work? Well, in this Cochrane review, meta-analysis of 167 studies, it looks like decreasing sodium does make a difference. There are multiple columns here. So this first set of columns is hypertensive patients, and this is normotensive patients. So in hypertensive patients who are on a high-sodium diet, compared to those on a low-sodium diet, it seems that there's an association with a reduction in blood pressure with a low-sodium diet. In normotensive patients, there is also an association with reduction in blood pressure, but it's a much smaller reduction, only one to maybe four millimeters of mercury uh, change in blood pressure. But as we talked about from that data from the 1980s, a two to five millimeter reduction in blood pressure may have a pretty large effect on mortality, stroke, and coronary heart disease outcomes. So going from sodium, let's talk a little bit about pharmacologic therapy, just three things that I'm going to show you, starting with the all hat trial. I think many of us are familiar with it. Very large randomized trials started off with doxazosin, chlorthalidone, and lodipine and lisinopril. Uh, during the study, the doxazosin arm was stopped for an increased incidence of heart failure. So patients then continued on chlorthalidone, amlodipine, and lisinopril. And the primary endpoint was fatal coronary heart disease or non-fatal MI, and there was no difference from the three treatments in that. Secondary outcomes were mortality, stroke, combined coronary heart disease, combined CVD, cerebral vascular disease. We found that the chlorthalidone actually made a better improvement in systolic blood pressure at five years. Amylodipine made a better improvement um, in diastolic blood pressure at five years. And the differences in secondary outcomes was similar for amylodipine and chlorthalidone, except that amylodipine appeared to show increased rate of heart failure at six years. And if you compare ACE inhibitors and chlorthalidone, ACE inhibitors actually had a higher rate of uh, coronary heart disease, stroke, and some of the other measures. So they recommended a thiazide type diuretic, which then later turned into, we more frequently use hydrochlorothiazide for patients than chlorthalidone. I think it was cheaper and maybe a marketing strategy, but there is some data about that also. The Mr. Fit trial, which in 1973 was a primary prevention population study, enrolled about 13,000 patients. And in 1980, they found, on review of their data, that the clinics that were using hydrochlorothiazide had a higher mortality rate. So they changed the study protocol to then recommend chlorthalidone over hydrochlorothiazide 
using that seven years of hydrochlorothiazide data to then compare it to the seven years of chlorothaladone patients plus whoever was moved over afterwards. And what they found actually was that, it's a little bit tough to see in the graph here, but that the chlorothaladone versus hydrochlorothiazide was a 21% risk reduction in cardiovascular events in these patients. So the chlorothaladone may actually have a better improvement. It has a longer half-life. It's almost twice as potent as hydrochlorothiazide. The accomplished trial, just to add a little more to this, uh, was a randomized trial of almost 12,000 patients, almost a three-year follow-up, looked at benazapril and ACE inhibitor and amlodipine calcium channel blocker versus the ACE inhibitor and, and thiazide type diuretic. Actually showed a reduction in events on those on the, on the calcium channel blocker ACE inhibitor uh, combination and a one millimeter lower blood pressure in the combination. So moving on from the pharmacologic therapy, and there are many studies of that. There's a lot of data out there, and I'm not trying to recommend one over the other. I'm just trying to show some points from that. But let's move to other avenues for controlling high blood pressure. And to do that, we're going to talk a little bit about autonomic function. This is a slide that's modified from Dr. Chi Fu, one of our cardiology faculty, works at the Institute for Exercise and Environmental Medicine. And many of you have seen me use this slide a bunch of times. You've seen me talk before. But this is a human here. Put the mouse back. When you are flat, the water in your body is evenly distributed from head to foot. As you stand up, the hydrostatic gradient from gravity pulls water down. Water runs downhill. If you did not have a mechanism to counteract that, you would stand up, your blood pressure here would go to zero, and you would pass out. Fall down, put your heart and your head at the same level, you get perfusion again. If you're on an airplane and somebody passes out, don't let them strap the patient into the chair. They need to lay the patient down. That's important. But there's a mechanism that our body uses to allow us to stand. When you stand up, what happens is that stroke volume falls. That reduces mean arterial pressure. And in the baroreceptors in the neck, then, they are less distended because there's less pressure. So they become relaxed. That turns off inhibition of the brainstem, which leads to vagal withdrawal in the heart, which is an increase in heart rate. Removing parasympathetic tone increases heart rate and some sympathetic activation in the heart to increase heart rate. Increases cardiac output, so to help improve blood pressure, but at the same time, peripheral sympathetic activation leads to a postganglionic norepinephrine release, causes vasoconstriction. That increases systemic vascular resistance, helps make a larger improvement in blood pressure, because mean arterial pressure, cardiac output times systemic, systemic vascular resistance, heart rate times stroke volume times SVR. So, Talking about sympathetic activation and hypertension, what we can do actually is measure sympathetic activity. I can take a nerve, I take a needle, look like an acupuncture needle, put, put it in the perineal nerve behind the knee and measure nerve activity to smooth muscle in the vasculature. What we find are spikes like this. Those spikes are meant to cause contraction of the sympathetic of the smooth muscle in the vasculature. And Increase systemic vascular resistance. It's often measured as bursts of activity per 100 heartbeats or total burst activity, total burst frequency, total burst amplitude. There are different ways to measure these numbers. It's important because there is some data that shows patients with hypertension have increased sympathetic nerve activity. Those here are normal tensive, so this would be a baseline, and then high normal blood pressure those who have been decided to have white coat hypertension, those with borderline hypertension by JNC guidelines, and then these with stage one, stage two, and essential hypertension with LVH on an echocardiogram, all have elevated sympathetic activity. So part of the idea of treatment here, maybe we can do something about sympathetic activity. First thing I want to talk about is actually, what if we do something to the baroreceptor? So baroreceptor modification, it's a Rios device, by doing this, we may be able to increase vagal tone, stop vagal withdrawal so that you don't, there's not an increase in heart rate, and uh, help reduce, help keep systemic vascular resistance from increasing by reducing sympathetic activation peripherally. So this is an investigational de device. There has been multiple studies of it. Uh, there are still many active on clinicaltrials.gov. They looked at 322 patients and with a primary outcome of acute and sustained efficacy of blood pressure drop at six months and they did not meet the primary endpoint of 322 patients. 
There was a funny randomization they used. It was a two to one. Of the 322 patients, they implanted all. Only 265 patients were randomized in two to one to either have the device turned on immediately or turned on six months later uh, with a comparison. So we'll see. Maybe some more work still to come on that. Here another uh, pictograph of autonomic function where the nerves go. I want to focus on this one here that goes from the ganglion to the kidney. Well, I think we all have heard about renal denervation. We can actually burn that nerve, ablate that nerve through various methods. And the primary one we've all talked about is from uh, is the simplicity uh, studies, hypertension one, hypertension two, hypertension three from Medtronic. And this is the one I was a local PI for. The data looked great to begin with. And simplicity hypertension one was affecting humans. And what we could find most recently published was at three years, there was a 30 millimeter reduction in systolic blood pressure from those who had the renal artery nerves ablated. I put the catheter up to, through the aorta into the renal artery, use the catheter in a protocol to try to break the nerve connection so that there's no efferent or efferent output from the kidney. Seemed to work very well. Simplicity 2 is a randomized study of renal nerve innovation. Again, a 30 millimeter blood pressure reduction uh, systolic in these patients at six months. Simplicity 3 is the one that recently finished enrolling, had a sham procedure involved. All patients got an angiogram uh, and then were randomized to either renal denervation or not, but patients did not know which one they had, and our own facility, I was blinded to knowing which one they had. We enrolled about nine patients in the study, and the data has recently come out and they did not meet their primary efficacy endpoint. So that has actually had some implications for other studies, which I'll talk about in just a minute. There are other companies looking at these devices. Medtronic was the first one to be doing these in the United States. There's a Boston Scientific device here, a St. Jude device, a microinfusion catheter, um, another renal denervation catheter, two sonic uh, sound-driven devices, and then a Covidian uh, device here. And then lastly, after devices, I want to talk about telemonitoring with a pharmacist, something that many groups are starting to do. We do something similar in the VA. Uh, uh, 450 patients here in the study identified from electronic medical record. The intervention group meets with pharmacists. They get frequent telephone calls, frequent treatment. They end up on a little more medicine, and it appears that at 12 and 18 months, 6 months, 12 and 18 months, they have a better reduction in systolic blood pressure. So I think it drives the point that much of resistant hypertension may be medication non-compliance. If somebody is constantly contacting the patient, constantly making sure they take the medicines, their blood pressure improves. So one of the slides I had before was new intervention trials, which included Enlighten 4, which was the St. Jude trial, stopped about a month ago, uh, with reasons at the time that they felt the Medtronic device would become FDA approved, and then why, why be in the middle of a research study when there's an FDA approved device? And, Physicians would have to decide, do I use the FDA-approved one or do I put somebody in a research study for a different device? And Simplicity 4 was stopped after the lack of efficacy from Simplicity 3. Simplicity 4 was looking at uh, renal denervation treatment in patients with moderate hypertension. There's also some more studies of carotid sinus stimulation. And uh, this ROX control hypertension study is a shunt study. It's this ROX device that makes an iliac artery to vein fistula to treat hypertension. It's been used in COPD and may be able to do something for hypertension. Remains to be seen so far. So future directions, you know, sodium content I think is important to talk about with patients. McDonald's was making menu changes. They have a long-term plan to reduce sodium in their menu. It's probably good for me, but uh, plans to reduce sugars, fats, and salt with a 20% calorie reduction, uh, especially in the Happy Meals. So you have to make changes in children, right? A lot of us, there's not much we can do, but it's the upcoming generation. Start changing habits. Things, things will get better in the long run. Telemedicine, group therapy, another thing we're trying to do at the VA, and maybe future autonomic interventions. So take home points. The JNC paper that's out could take it as JNC guidelines, but recommends a goal of less than 150 over 90 for patients over the age of 60. A reduction in sodium intake may reduce strokes, heart disease, and heart failure by reducing blood pressure. An autonomic nervous system modification appeared a very promising intervention early on, but may require further in investigation. So I'm going to leave you with 
I'm going to take your blood pressure, so try to relax and not think about what a high reading might mean for your chances of living a long, healthy life. <laughs> Thank you very much.